Last week, we talked a lot about using the text in your writing and specifically focused on summary and paraphrase. This week, we are going to focus on the third way to use the text, and, and this is my favorite way, um, direct quotations. Now, just to recap, I want to talk, I just want to give you guys a reminder of um, summary and paraphrase, the difference between the two. Um, summary is, remember, we're kind of looking at the gist of the sum total um, of the story in its entirety. A paraphrase, on the other hand, is more specific. It's looking at specific detailed sections um, of a text. Now, they're similar in that they both require you to use your own words. Um, summary doesn't necessarily need um, a, an in-text citation. However, a paraphrase does. But just like there are limits to summaries, there are limits to paraphrase paraphrases because sometimes, like I said last week, you want to use the voice of the writer within your writing. Uh, in other words, you can't, it, the author says it so specifically and it's purposeful and it gets the, it, it gets a point that you just, you, you can't yourself, you can't yourself replicate, right? And to do that, like I said, we want to use direct quotations and direct quotations are a wonderful way of using the text and showing you understand the text. But there's a specific way to use direct quotations and that's what we call this idea of integration. All right, so let's look first at what direct quotations are. And direct quotations, as you know, are words taken directly from the text, right? It's the author's words. They are not changed from the original. And in order to show that they are the author's words and not yours, they require, direct quotations require quotation marks around the phrases or the sentences. If you fail to do that, that is plagiarism. All right. In addition to these quotation marks, you also have to have an internal or in-text parenthetical citation at the end of the sentence. Now, why do we use direct quotations? Well, direct quotations are used to support an established argument that's developed by you, the writer. They help explain what the author of the text is doing and why he or she does it. It also provides evidence or proof that what's being said is both logical and reasonable. In other words, it didn't just come out of thin air. You're not making stuff up. If you want to say, a, if you want to make a specific argument or point about something the author is saying or doing, your set, when you use direct quotations, you're showing your your reader that, hey, this is where I got it from. I'm not making it up. Okay. So when do we want to use direct quotations? And I always like to say that quotations are, are like a hot spice, right? Too much, it spoils your meal too little, it's bland. So you want to find a balance of, of how many direct quotations um, to use. And I guess I, I will say not necessarily how many, but how much of the text you use. Um, in other words, a, a lot of times I find that students or writers want to use as much of the quote as possible and when that happens it becomes too long right you're putting you know sentence after sentence of the text in your writing and it kind of loses its e efficacy long sentences or sentence after sentence or these block quotations are are off-putting to a reader because if if the 
if the reader wanted to read that much of the text that you're quoting or analyzing, they may as well read the story itself. So instead of long sentences, you want to just look at the best nugget or the most powerful powerful portion of the quote that, that you intend to use. So I know you guys are asking, how long is too long? Well, Direct quotations should be short. There should be no more than two lines of text that's directly quoted in your writing. Instead, you want to paraphrase um, around those longer quotes and pick just the best of the two. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean in, in just a second. Um, by If you use lengthy, long quotations, you lose control of of the paper you want to make sure that your voice controls the tone of the paper now when looking at what text to choose you want to make sure that they enhance your work don't just flip through the pages and you know spin a flip a coin or or you know point your finger somewhere and say, okay, that's the quote I'm going to use. You really want to make sure that the quotes that you use have a purpose in your paper, that they fit your writing, and that they add clarity, they clarify your argument, they clarify your ideas rather than confuse them. So that's why I say it's so important to make sure that you read Right? You read the text uh, before you even begin thinking about writing. Because if you don't know what, what's happening in the story, if you don't know what's going on, you can't necessarily come up with a cohesive argument um, on your own. So, all right. Just to reiterate, you want the best nugget. So, uh, no more than two lines. You want to make sure that you choose quotes that have a purpose, that fit your writing, and that clarify your ideas for your reader. How not to use direct quotations. Well, you don't want to use quotes to tell the story. Remember, you are operating, anytime you write an analysis of, of a text, whether that's a film, a movie, a, no, a, a novel, um, an article, whatever you want to call it, anytime you write about a text, you want to operate under the assumption that the reader is familiar with the story or the text that you're writing about. Um, for example, when you write this literary analysis, you want to operate under the assumption that I've read either the things they carried where are you going, where have you been, and the thing in the forest, which I have. So you don't need to tell the plot of the story. You don't want to use quotes for the sake of filling up space, right? I've got to fill in, i got to have five pages, let me just, you know, put in quote after quote, right, um, just to take up space. You, you want to make sure, like I said earlier, that your direct quotations are relevant and meaningful. You don't want to use quotes that are overly long. Um, in other words, you want to avoid long passages. And here's the one thing that I want you guys to really remember. This idea that you don't want to use a quote at the start of a sentence or at the end of a paragraph. And why do I say you can't use direct quotations at the start of a paragraph? Well, I'm, I say that you don't want to do that because at the start of the paragraph, what should your what should your first sentence be in any given paragraph? Well, it should be your topic sentence, right? You want the first word, right? And you don't want to end a paragraph with a quote because you want to take the time to make sure any every time you use a direct quotation you have to take the time to explain and expound upon it and connect it back to some larger idea and i'll talk about that um, once we get more into at the end of this lecture so um, at the end of a paragraph you don't want to end a paragraph with a direct quote just like you want the first word of an argument or the first word of a paragraph you also want the last word so first and last should be you so not at the start or at the end of a paragraph so 
there are some common pitfalls when using direct quotations and this is what I'm really concerned about with the, with in in this particular lecture the loose balloon quote or quotes that are dropped in and this is where that idea of integration comes in quotes need to be held down with your writing in other words you have to show with your writing the connection between your ideas and the authors. If you have these dropped in quotes, they're disconnected. In other words, direct quotations need to be integrated. What does it mean to be integrated? Well, it means your writing and the author's writing work together. And what I mean by that is direct quotations cannot stand on their own as complete sentences or complete ideas in your paper. So the point that I'm trying to make is that you, right, you, not the author, have an insightful claim of your own in order to support that insightful claim. You have to have, um, you have to cite the sources um, you found and this goes with both the literary analysis and anytime you use secondary or primary sources anything that's not yours in order to do that you have to transition smoothly um, your ideas with someone else's and that's really what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes but before um, we talk about what integration looks like i want to make sure that you understand what i mean uh, by loose balloons right? Uh, I want to show you what not to do. So take a look at this little passage right here. Now I have uh, this lovely little kind of, of paragraph, right? Tim O'Brien, author of The Things They Carry, voices the idea that the mental burdens outweigh the physical agony that those in war must carry. Now that's my thought, that's my idea, that's my point. Now I'm going to have to prove, right, or show examples of this point with examples from the text, right? And here I have an example from the text. They carried all the emotional baggage of men who might die, grief, terror, love, longing. Uh, these were intangibles, right? So here's my, my text from O'Brien. After I have my text from O'Brien, I'm going to explain right um i'm gonna have my own writing after that so o'brien argues that fear longing responsibility etc etc um outweigh the physical torture they must endure to stay alive etc so here i have my words the author's words my words again now you might think to yourself i don't understand what's wrong with that well if you look at this this quote right here, right? I'm using this as a sentence all on its own. It's kind of sandwiched in between my two ideas. It's not, it, it's, it's disconnected. My ideas and the author's ideas aren't connected together. It's standing out there on its own. It's not weighted down. You think of it like a sandwich, right? Like here are my two slices of bread and here's my meat in the middle. Um, but I don't, I, I don't have anything. It, you can't sandwich a quote like that um, in between um, ideas. So um, I'll, I'll show you another example of what I mean by loose balloon. Uh, here's my idea about Lieutenant Cross, um, how Martha occupies much uh, the Martha occupies much of Cross's time and weighs heavily on his heart every night. That's my idea. That's my, what I'm saying. I'm using, he would return to his hole and watch the night and wonder if Martha was a virgin. That's my proof, right? That's my um, use of the text. Then I have um, my own thoughts again. This repeated idea of Martha's virginity has a symbolic importance to the story, right? Now, again, I'm doing something right because I have my point and I have my text to support it. But what makes this 
not good is that I'm using the text to stand on its own as a complete sentence. Another example, here's my thought, here's my support. This again um, is, a, is offset and disconnected from my idea in that I'm trying to use the text as independent thoughts within my writing. And that's, that's not the way it works. Another example, I have my thought sandwiched in between my two thoughts are the author's words standing, trying to stand on its own as a complete sentence. Another example, another example, right? Um, so how do we fix this idea of loose balloons? The first way to fix it is to use a signal phrase. And signal phrases are kind of what we talked about last week when we talked about phrases of attribution. Um, signal phrases are used to attribute quoted passages or material from another source, like any of, of, of these, like he comments, she considers, uh, such and such character maintains, right? All of these are, are, are phrases of attribution um, that you can use to show um, that, that they're not your words. So how do I fix it with a signal phrase? Well, you wanna use a signal phrase and separate the quote with a comma. Each of the soldiers deals with death and pain differently. My thought, right? Kiowa remarks, quote, the lieutenant is in some deep hurt. It was real heavy duty hurt. The man cares. Kiowa, however, has a different reaction. So if we look at, let's take a look at how that compares to my original, okay? It's the same, you know, stuff, but here I have my loose balloon quote, right? And this cannot stand on its own. But if I add a signal phrase, such as I have here, my signal phrase with a comma, and then I quote the material, it's no longer standing on its own. I have put my writing, my writing, with the author's writing. So now it all reads more smoothly. With one signal phrase, I have integrated the author's quote, the author's words into my, uh, into my, my writing. So signal phrases are a wonderful way, these phrases of attribution are a wonderful way of integrating direct quotations into your writing. Another way of, of fixing these loose balloon quotes is to introduce the quotation with a complete sentence and then add a colon. A colon or is these two little dots, not the organ in your body, but um, a colon. So we looked at this example earlier when we were talking about um, loose balloons. So how do I fix that loose balloon? Well, here I have my complete sentence about Tim O'Brien um, voices the idea about the physical agony and the things they carried, or, or the things in war, or whatever, whatever the sentence says. So that's a complete sentence, that's a complete thought. That's my complete thought, that's my words, right? So in order to integrate this quote, I can then add this colon Right, that shows that they're two separate, completely different, um, they're separate, but they're together, if that makes sense. So I have my complete thought followed by um, my quotation. The author's words and my words are no longer separated. This is no, the, the quote is no longer standing on its own as a complete thought. Um, they're together, they're integrated. That's another way uh, to fix it. My favorite part, um, and I hope that you guys take this, this one into consideration. My favorite part, um, way to fix it, is to break it up. 
right? Make the quotation part of your own sentence without using any punctuation between your words and the author's words um, you're quoting. In other words, you have an explanation of the author's big ideas and important quotes. You're only using the best nugget, right? So let's look at an example. Let's look at an example of, of breaking it up. Due to his foolishness, Cross is responsible for Lavender's death. In the end, Cross destroys the photographs and letters that Martha has sent him. This is his attempt to burn blame, but Cross learns that that is impossible. He must forget Martha and add on onto his load the full responsibility for all of his men. Cross's name, uh, very name, is symbolic of the weight that he must bear. So here um, I have my little nugget. My quote from the text, right? So let's look at that compared to the original. Here is my loose balloon, and in this loose balloon, I have three sentences uh, that I've taken from the text, and I have tried uh, and I've put them to prove my point. And it does prove my point, but it's a lot, right? And what is the most important part? of these kind of three sentences. Well, the, the part that's most important to me, the part that I, I really want to, to emphasize is this idea of burning blame, right? That's the thing that sticks out to me uh, the most in those three sentences. So I have taken this kind of lengthy quote and I have boiled it down to the most important part to me and put it into my own writing and I therefore have integrated, I have connected, I have woven together my words and the author's words to make my overall point. So um, another way of, of breaking it up, uh, an example, Often, Jimmy Cross pretends he's somewhere else. However, he learns too late that distractions and imagination can be a killer, right? So that is an integrated quote compared to uh, my loose balloon. Here, I've broken it up. Do you guys see how this reads more smoothly than this, right? So uh, my words and the author's words integrated together, non-integrated because they're separate. Okay, um, just one more example of, of more nuggets. Uh, music and popular culture form Connie's views of love and men, views that are steeped in fantasy and idealisms. Those are my um, thoughts, those are my words. Um, and now I gotta prove it, so I'm going to kind of paraphrase and direct quote at the same time. She spends her time dreaming about boys whose faces dissolve into the idea of uh, the idea uh, into an oh gosh that's into an idea of feeling not a felling. A feeling mixed up with the urgent, insistent pounding of the music and imagining a love the way it was in movies and promised in songs. So I've taken bits and pieces from pages 121 and 122 and I've integrated them into my own writing. So um, that is, that's a good example of, of using um, only the nuggets. and. I, I urge you guys to consider kind of implementing this skill and this strategy because um, it reads so much more smoothly um, than long broken, uh, long drawn out um, direct quotations. Okay, I'm going to stop it here uh, because I've gone on a little bit longer than I wanted to and I'm going to pick up um, some more with, with quote integration. So stay tuned.